Across Australia, each state and territory has legislation defining the role of the statutory agency which has the responsibility for the investigation of alleged child abuse and neglect. Their primary function is to undertake investigations of reports of alleged harm and to identify children who are in need of care and protection, as well as to provide ongoing care for those children who, where harm has been substantiated. Police investigate these matters if it's thought to relate to an alleged criminal offence. Harm is defined in child protection legislation and spans physical, emotional and sexual harm as well as neglect. And in relation to, the in to injuries where it's thought to have been suspicious of abuse or neglect, forensic medical opinions are requested to contribute to legal proceedings, which include child protection hearings as well as criminal court proceedings. Whilst the workload of a paediatrician in Australia varies depending on their location and type of practice, many paediatricians are required at various times to be involved in child protection matters. In Australia there are a very small number of specialist forensic paediatricians who work almost exclusively in this field. Within, while within the scope of general clinical practice, paediatricians often function as advocates for children to enable children to function, to be included, to participate in family schools and activities. But for paediatricians who are required infrequently to function as expert witness, they perceive some tension between advocacy and expert when they are required to adopt a neutral, non-partisan position to provide information and opinion to the courts. For those paediatricians who function more commonly in legal jurisdictions, the distinction of these roles is more clear to them and not perceived as potentially conflicting. At present, there is wild, wide variation of practice of how medico-legal opinions are communicated, and in particular, a lack of consensus opinion about what should be the principles underpinning the role of the medical expert witness and how these should be applied when writing medico-legal reports relating to child abuse. All of these principles are familiar to all of you who work in legal jurisdictions and in particular as the expert witness, differentiating their task from the witness of facts who provides evidence only on what they have seen, heard or have otherwise directly experienced. The expert witness, by contrast, by virtue of their expertise and experience, are permitted to provide opinion to the trier of fact, usually a jury in a jury trial. The rules governing admissibility of expert evidence requires the expert witness to only adhere to their boundaries of expertise to be able to differentiate facts from opinion and to avoid speculation. It is essential that the jury is able to follow their process of logic and thought processes which forms the basis of their opinion and it is also essential that the expert witness does not usurp the function of the trier of fact by providing opinion on the ultimate issue which is although inevitably their evidence may come close to it. In a survey of Australian judiciary, the courts have voiced some concerns about reliance on expert witnesses in legal proceedings. In particular, courts have some concerns about the potential for such witnesses to have undue influence on the jury because of impressive qualifications or expertise. The courts want and need assistance with fact-finding, but they encounter problems such as overt bias, use of complex language, experts exceeding their boundaries of expertise or failing to define the basis of their opinions as common problems with the expert witness. The trial of Sally Clark in the United Kingdom brought these issues into the spotlight and in particular the role of Professor Sir Roy Meadow, an esteemed and prominent paediatrician in the United Kingdom who gave evidence where it was thought to have unfairly influenced the jury in finding Sally Clark guilty of murdering her two infant sons, a conviction which was later overturned and Professor Sir Roy Meadow experienced disciplinary action from the General Medical Council which was also later successfully appealed. For paediatricians involved in child protection, there is currently a lot of diversity of, of practice, forensic practice and processes. Based on my forensic training, my aim of my study was to develop a tool to guide the writing of medico-legal reports, aiming to define the structure and the application of key principles to construction of these reports that can be used for review within the peer quality assurance processes prior to their entry into legal jurisdictions. I nominated an expert panel of experienced child protection paediatricians to seek their agreement about the content of the tool and to provide a comment on each of the principles and how they might be applied in the child protection re uh, report tool. The expert panel consisted of a number of experienced paediatricians across the country with a vast experience of a mean of 19 years. Most of them worked um, from about 28 hours on average in, exclusively in child protection and produced on average 52 medical legal reports per year, appearing in court on average five times per year. Many of the 
um, respondents from the expert panel indicated that they thought the tool that I had, had developed and sent to them for their um, opinion would be potentially useful for trainees who were learning how to write and function in the forensic jurisdiction and also potentially useful for their own use in writing medico-legal reports as well as for the, to structure the peer review process. They also thought that the tool could be equally applicable to genital injury as well as physical injuries, other physical injuries. The report tool consisted of 20 principles or sections and I used examples from various um, injury reports that I had written to illustrate the application of these principles and sought from the expert panel their level of agreement or disagreement and also allowed for a neutral response as well. The, in, in contrast to what I envisaged, envisaged as a single tool to guide the forensic report writing, I since from receiving the responses from the expert panel, modified the tool into two steps. This allows for a brief interim report to be written to communicate with investigators in the early stages and then provide a more detailed opinion to be provided once all the investigations have been completed. The interim report would have the um, following sections which are on the slide upon which the expert panel uniformly agreed upon would be appropriate for the context of suspicious injuries in children. The report was enabled to enable the paediatrician to form some provisional opinion to police and to statutory investigators which may be able to be used in children's court to meet the protective needs of the child whilst an investigation would, would still be undertaken. The brief report should be constructed after a few days after a child has been admitted to hospital with substantial injuries which are thought to be suspicious of abuse or neglect. The provisional opinion um, in such a report would be limited given the absence at that stage of detailed police or statutory investigation information and the provisional opinion would be stated something like this that none of the in injuries at this stage have been adequately explained and therefore in view of the child's age and developmental capabilities it must be considered that they may have been inflicted. A forensic medical evaluation is ongoing and a final report will be available when the police and statutory investigation has been completed and the material has been reviewed by the undersigned. This is probably discrepant with what is current practice whereby paediatricians tend to provide a detailed report fairly early on and unfortunately tend to lock themselves into an opinion which they are therefore are later often unwilling to revise when um, further information comes to light. The interim report the, um, would have the key principles being that it would, must be understandable to a variety of professionals who are involved in, as the consumers or end users of these reports, that they predominantly outline the facts that are known at that point in time in the first few days following admission of a child to hospital and explicitly gives, provides an opportunity for the forensic paediatrician to outline the information that they require as necessary in order to formulate a final forensic conclusion regarding the etiology of the injuries on the child. The final report, in contrast with the interim report, would have the same sections as outlined in the interim report focusing on facts, namely the, the report writer's details and particularly their qualifications and expertise the referral information outlining how they came to be involved in the case, the source of the information that they've relied upon including the examinations, who did that, the tests and the nature of the tests and who reported on them and detailed descriptions and potentially documentation such as photographs of the injuries where available. And the next section outlining the reported history, in particular the source of the history that is provided. The forensic opinion at this point in time would focus on the key forensic issues, namely those of force, mechanism of injury and timing and also provide some opinion regarding the prognosis and treatment of the injuries because that is relevant in the criminal jurisdiction to the nature of the charges that have been laid. It is also the, final, the, the task of the forensic paediatrician to formulate a forensic conclusion regarding each injury or injury cluster. The injury conclusion I've outlined in this table to fall into one of four categories. Those that are inflicted are by definition caused by another person. In particular it does not comment on the intent of the actions that that, um, that, that other person may be thinking as that is beyond the scope of what can be inferred from the injury. 
the injury could have been self-inflicted when, when the injury could have been derived from the child's own behaviour as, as a result of an interaction with their physical environment. But in those circumstances it is necessary to consider neglect and in particular the key issues for the forensic paediatrician to consider is the extent to which each injury event is foreseeable or preventable. The third category is that the injury is adequately explained, in other words it happened in the way that was reported by the caregivers or who, was witnessed, who witnessed the injury event at the time, but also in those circumstances neglect must also be considered. And for many injuries or injury clusters the, the conclusion may be that the, in, the causation is indeterminate. The principles of opinion formulation are as outlined on this table, that the forensic medical paediatrician must adhere to their boundaries of expertise, that the language that they use to communicate their strength of opinion must be understandable and uniformly interpreted by those that read um, the reports, and in particular potentially use information to indicate the strength such as likely or probable or certain to be able to differentiate the opinion when it's applied in different jurisdictions where different standards of proof are applied. The basis of an opinion must be specified and in particular if there is contention or debate or in particular if there are limitations in the available research, for example only population data to support the opinion that, that must be explicitly stated, that the limitations of the opinions are specified, that it's understandable and well balanced, in other words not biased towards either a prosecution or defence perspective but simply an informative um, report outlining the opinion without bias. The scope of the opinion must be limited to the injury and must explicitly exclude the psychosocial risk factors to support the opinion. That's not because those issues aren't important but because they are entered by other witnesses into the various legal jurisdictions and therefore are able to be considered on their own merit. The relevant information that, to, that, it, that is necessary to formulate opinion must be included, such as the developmental skills of the child, any me medical history that is of relevance to differential diagnosis of the injury, predisposing medical conditions and factors that may have modified the injury appearance must all be discussed or considered in the report writing. All the investigations must have been reviewed, including medical notes, investigations, ambulance reports, police and statutory investigations. The report must, must avoid speculation and must differentiate fact from opinion, and in particular avoid forcing a conclusion if inherent uncertainty exists. In conclusion, the, report, the study that I undertook in evaluating this medico-legal report writing tool, evaluated from identified experts in child protection, their consensus of opinion regarding the underlying principles for medico-legal reports for paediatricians who work in this area of child protection who are asked to contribute opinions to legal jurisdictions regarding injuries that are thought to be suspicious of harm and are already being investigated by authorities. The outcome was that most of the expert panel agreed with many of the principles within the tool and where there was some dissent or disagreement those were able to be um, sorted out by using a two-step report process rather than having just a single report written at one single point in time. The study potentially provides a basis for the consensus of practice for paediatricians working in child protection which can be applied across all settings in Australia where children are evaluated for suspicious injuries. The provision of final medical, forensic medical opinions will probably fall outside of the boundaries of expertise for many paediatricians who do not have specific forensic training, but they would however be able to provide interim reports to enabling the paediatrician to acknowledge the limitations of their expertise and avoid forcing a definitive conclusion at a stage where investigation is still being undertaken. I believe that it would be useful for this tool that I've developed to be determined not just by my own profession but also by the judiciary as a representative of the courts who are the end users of these reports. I would like to seek um, evaluation by the judiciary in the application of this process of providing two-step reports by also having tertiary child protection units routinely adopt the report writing steps um, summarised in the study in particular evaluating the utility of the tool as a guide for writers of reports would be useful as this application as a peer review tool. And perhaps the most useful application of the tool is to, is to train future forensic experts who aim to, to work in forensic child protection. Thank you for listening. Uh -huh.